you are right now in this country. But for those of you who are not in Toronto, I would just like to share that here, at least, the sun is shining. It's approximately 14 degrees outside. It's an absolutely beautiful springtime day. So although spring is not officially uh, upon us for a few more days yet, spring has sprung in Toronto at least. Okay, so today's topic is about talking to your doctor. Are you speaking the same language? I know you're expecting me to talk about Parkinson's and how you can get the most out of your appointments with your neurologists, but please bear with me for a minute as I share an experience I have had recently that I think will help to explain the point that I'm trying to get across today. 22 years ago, my new family doctor ordered some cardiac tests for me as he was concerned about my slightly elevated blood pressure. My old GP, who had been my doctor since I was a teenager, was never particularly worried about my blood pressure, as it had always been a bit high, and he just put it down to the fact that I was overweight and I really didn't exercise very much. Also, I didn't have any symptoms, except that I did get a bit out of breath when I ran to catch a bus or when I ran up a couple of flights of stairs. So nobody considered those to really be any uh, symptoms of significance when it came to any problems with my heart. Anyway, the new young and ambitious doctor said, sometimes women and heart disease are ignored and swept under the carpet. So I'm going to have my secretary make an appointment for you at the hospital in downtown Toronto, known for its expertise in the diagnosis and treatment of heart disease. Long story short, after several tests, because I failed the first one miserably, I need to say, a few weeks later, I found myself on the operating table, having a triple bypass. And had my new doctor not insisted on me having the tests, I wouldn't be having this chat with you today, period, the end. Every year since then, I have had a follow-up appointment with the same heart specialist that I started out with on this journey all those years ago. Before I go into his office to see him, I have two rather lengthy tests the same day, the results of which are sitting on his computer screen before I even sit down with him, so he can see exactly how my heart is doing and what, if any, treatment is needed. Well, thank goodness for those tests, because just like 22 years ago, I still don't have any symptoms. So it's a very good thing he doesn't have to rely on me to tell him if there is something wrong. I hadn't really thought very much about this in relation to the treatment of Parkinson's. But a few weeks ago, at my annual appointment with my specialist, I sat down in the waiting room across from a gentleman who I believe had Parkinson's. I'm sure some of you are thinking, for goodness sake, Sandy, Surely you must know what Parkinson's looks like by now after all these years. But as I said to you before, just because it walks and talks and looks like Parkinson's doesn't necessarily make it so. Let's put it this way. If this gentleman didn't have Parkinson's disease, I will be very surprised. Anyway, back to my story. The man was trying to communicate with his wife, but because of his very soft voice and slurred speech, she was having a great deal of difficulty understanding what he was trying to tell her. At that point, I thought to myself, isn't it a good thing he doesn't have to say very much to his heart specialist? Because thanks to the tests that he had, just as I did, uh, just before his appointment, the results of which, and, and the, uh, combined with the results of his recent blood work, the specialist could see exactly how his heart is functioning, what his cholesterol le levels are like, etc. If the specialist does have any questions, they can be very direct, to the point. So, based on a minimum amount of communication between the doctor and the patient, the doctor knows exactly what treatment is to he has to prescribe and if any changes need to be made. 
Your neurologist, on the other hand, isn't so fortunate. And without the luxury of any kind of images or the results of any blood work, he or she has to rely on a physical examination as well as what you describe as your symptoms and what your individual challenges are. In other words, you, yes, you, need to have a good understanding of Parkinson's in order and to specific and specifically your Parkinson's in order to assist your doctor to get the maximum benefit <clears throat> out of your appointments as well as the maximum benefits out of your medications. Parkinson's is one of the most treatable of all the chronic neurological conditions. But make no mistake, it is not easily treatable. The choice of drug, <clears throat> the dose of the drug, the timing of the drug are all crucial. And therapy must be individualized to meet each person's unique requirements. The distinction between the symptoms of Parkinson's and medication side effects is a frequent source of confusion and can lead to ineffective and inappropriate treatment. Quite often, treatable symptoms, such as the non-motor symptoms, for example, that I've spoken to you about in the past, are not recognized as part of Parkinson's, and therefore, individuals suffer needlessly just because they don't have a good understanding of their disease. I've had many patients over the years say to me, why do I have to learn how to talk to my doctor? He or she is the specialist. They should know how to handle it all. Reliance on one's physician works well for simple problems. Parkinson's, however, is not a simple problem. Anything but. Complex problems require complex solutions. And if you and your doctor are not speaking the same language, there is a lot of room for misunderstanding and miscommunication. Most of you who are listening today are all too aware of the fact that your doctors have a very limited time to see you. The average follow-up appointment with your specialist is usually about 15 minutes, which is often insufficient time to wade through the complex symptoms of Parkinson's. If you, the person with Parkinson's, misinterprets your symptoms <clears throat> or describes them ambiguously, the specialist won't get an accurate picture of what is going on. I don't want to bore you any longer about why it's so important to get the most out of your neurologist visit, but I do feel strongly about this because I have seen firsthand that the difference between optimal and ineffective therapy can be the difference between you needing 24-7 care and having to go into a nursing home versus being able to continue to live in your own home with minimal assistance. That's why this is so important. Before I get into some tips about what you can do to get the most out of your doctor's visits, I want to talk to you about your doctors and the importance of finding a doctor who is the right fit for you. Regardless of whether it is your GP, a general neurologist, or a movement disorder specialist who is managing your Parkinson's treatment, you should feel comfortable in your relationship and feel that it is truly a partnership, i.e. a good match. Quite often, I am asked by folks who call us for guidance and information, what is a movement disorder specialist anyway? Or, what's the difference between a general neurologist and a neurologist that specialize, specializes in movement disorders? I think the easiest way to explain this is to start with your general practitioner, also known, of course, as your family doctor. A general practitioner has a general knowledge of your general health problems. Note I said a general knowledge of health related of health related issues. Some knowledge about a lot of different things that can go wrong with your body. 
Let's take your heart, for example. If your blood pressure is high when you go in for your checkup, your GP will probably prescribe a medication to lower your blood pressure and have you come back in a couple of months to see if indeed the medication he has prescribed for you um, has helped your blood pressure to come down. If it has, then you'll continue taking the medication and have your blood pressure checked periodically. If, on the other hand, however, your blood pressure is still elevated when you go back for your follow-up appointment, or if other problems have arisen since uh, your last appointment, such as swelling in your legs, or you might be complaining of shortness of breath, etc., then your GP will probably refer you to a heart specialist, as he or she has taken you as far as he can with his general understanding of the heart. With me so far? A GP also has a general understanding of Parkinson's, but their knowledge is very basic, and Parkinson's is very complicated. So, a general neurologist has a general understanding of many problems associated with the brain, including a basic understanding of Parkinson's. Their understanding is greater than that of a general practitioner or family doctor, but not in-depth enough to treat the complications as they occur with the progression of the Parkinson's. Whether you like it or not, Parkinson's does get slowly worse over time, slowly but surely. So, all possible, you should see a movement disorder specialist. So exactly what is a movement disorder specialist, and why do we always harp at you and recommend that you should really be seeing one, either on a regular basis or as a consultant at least once? A movement disorder specialist is a doctor, a neurologist, who is trained specifically to treat movement disorders. And my point is, Parkinson's is a movement disorder a neurological condition that affects movement. Not rocket science, right? Movement disorder specialists must complete their residency training in neurology and then complete additional training called a fellowship in movement disorders. These are the most qualified doctors to treat Parkinson's because of their in-depth knowledge of the disease, its symptoms, medications, and they keep up to date with all the current research as well. I realize that maybe that there may not be a movement disorder specialist in your area. In this case, even if it means having to travel for a consultation with one, it would be worthwhile just to ensure that you're on the right road and that your Parkinson's is being optimally managed. If seeing a movement disorder special, specialist is simply out of the question, then find the right general neurologist or a gerontologist. That's a doctor that specializes in uh, problems of people who are senior citizens. Um, you could find an internist, a doctor that specializes in all problems related to internal medicine or even your general practitioner, especially if each and every one of those is willing to consult with a movement disorder specialist as needed. Regardless of what type of doctor is treating your Parkinson's, here are a few questions you can ask yourself to help you decide if your doctor is indeed right for you. First, are you comfortable speaking with your doctor? If you, had, if you have answered no to this question, then perhaps you need to find a new doctor because good communication between the two of you is an essential component to you receiving appropriate treatment. Secondly, do you feel respected by your doctor? In other words, does your doctor listen to you? Doctors are the expert, experts when it comes to the treatment of your Parkinson's. But doctors need to recognize 
that you're the experts of your symptoms and how your Parkinson's is impacting on your quality of life. You're the one with Parkinson's, not them. Three, are your questions <clears throat> answered to your satisfaction? I just have to have a sip of water, sorry. So I'll go back to that. Are your questions answered to your satisfaction? Or do you come away from a visit feeling that you have not been taken seriously or that you have wasted your time? Fourth, can you get in touch with your doctor in between your visits? Given how busy doctors are, it is not realistic to expect to be able to contact the doctor directly if you run into a problem but your doctor should provide you with a way to get a message to him or her if you have an issue that simply can't wait until your next appointment. You have every right to ask a question like, what happens if I have a new symptom? Or if my medications aren't working as well as they did? Or if I develop some side effects that I just can't live with? How can I get in touch with you? Doctors should provide you with that information. When it comes to deciding which of your doctors you should be getting in touch with about a change in your condition, here is something you should think about. Although it's natural to assume any and all health problems you have now are related to your Parkinson's, Parkinson's can't be blamed for everything that happens to you. So, an appointment with your general practitioner may be all you need. So it's often a good idea to start with him or her to see if the changes you are experiencing may be caused by another medical problem. For example, shortness of breath can be related to anxiety and panic attacks, which is a non-motor symptom of Parkinson's. But it's also a very common problem associated with heart disease. So it's very important to rule heart disease out first, as it, that can definitely be life-threatening, and you definitely need to be seeking the advice and counsel of your GP if you suddenly become short of breath. Now, let's look at how you can mac maximize your time with your doctor and leave your appointment confident that all your most important questions and concerns have been addressed. You need to come equipped with the right information as well as the right questions. Start by organizing your health information and your questions in advance. These cannot be exhaustive lists. Time will not permit your doctor to go over absolutely everything that has happened to you since your last visit, especially if your last visit was six, eight months, or even a year ago. So, start with the three most important things that are problematic right now. The things that are really interfering with your quality of life. Of course, there will be more than three things that are concerning you, but plan ahead and pick the three that are a priority for you to ensure that they are addressed first. We have two forms available for you here that I think will be very helpful to get you started. One is called the Parkinson's Summary, which lists motor symptoms, non-motor symptoms, details about your medications, dietary concerns, and general statements about your lifestyle, which include things like, over the past month, I would describe my activity as, and one option is normal with no limitations, and at the other end of the spectrum is pretty much bedridden, rarely out of bed. This form will give you an idea of the issues that the doctor needs to know about and may include things you never thought to tell him or her about. All you have to do is tick the box beside the symptom that is an issue for you, and then decide which of those boxes that you have ticked 
are the most problematic. This is like a process of elimination or a process of inclusion, no matter how you look at it. Your most important and problematic issues need to be dealt with first, but you need to go through the list. The other form I mentioned is how to get the most out of your neurologist visit. And this will guide you through the things you need to do and say to help you make the most of that precious 15-minute appointment. Remember, you won't get another one for at least six or eight months, or maybe even a year. So you need to get the biggest bang for your buck while you're there. If you have any forms that require the doctor to fill in, such as a request for handicap parking, for example, any disability forms, any medications that you need prescriptions for, make sure you give those to the doctor at the beginning of the appointment. It's not fair to the doctor to have to extend your appointment and therefore delay his time in seeing his next patient if you dump a lot of that necessary um, form filling in at the end of the appointment. They need to know what you need in that way right at the beginning. Another important tip, please, 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 don't try to be a good patient and put your best foot forward during your appointment. I know it's natural to want to do that, but it's really important to be as honest as you can possibly be during your appointment. Don't be afraid to talk about your Parkinson's when it's at its worst, even if you're feeling okay on the day of your appointment. Your specialist can only give you the best treatment if they know what is really going on. So if during that 15 minute period things are tickety-boo, you're doing well, your medications are working, the doctor is really not getting a good sample of what the other 23 and three quarters of your hours of your day are like. That's not fair to him or her, because then you'll be mad at them that they didn't provide you with adequate treatment, and it certainly isn't fair to you, because then you're gonna to have to wait another six months and things could go to heck in a handbasket if they don't treat your symptoms appropriately. Don't feel you have to talk doctor speak or in medical jargon. You don't have to impress the doctor. Use the words you're comfortable with, okay? If you want to talk about your tremor as shaking or even show the doctor when you're there what your tremor or your shaking looks like, don't hesitate to do that. Again, you need to speak your speak. Don't be intimidated by the importance of doctor speak. Please, 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 don't be afraid to ask questions. If the doctor says things you don't understand, ask them to explain. Don't try to sit there and pretend that you understand every word that's being said, because I assure you, it is much better to admit you don't understand than to pretend you do and find out that you don't know what you need to do once you get home. Take notes. If you're anything like me, heaven forbid if you are, but anyway, if you're anything like me, you may forget some things that were discussed during your appointment. I make it a habit to take notes to help me remember what we went over and any instructions I was given so I can refer to those things after I get home. If I were you, I know many of you can't read your writing these days, take a small tape recorder to your appointment to ensure you capture everything you talked about. Of course, you'll have to ask the doctor for permission for, to do that, as they also have to be comfortable with you doing that. But if they're not, then I think that kind of signals a problem. If a doctor's not comfortable with the instructions that he's given during your appointment or with the things that you've talked about, hmm, 
that's not a good sign. That means they're not very confident in the things that they're talking to you about. So maybe you need to look for a new doctor. So at any rate, if you can't write things down, if you can't have someone with you to write them down for you, so you can refresh your memory when you get home, as I said, a tape recorder works brilliantly. Try not to feel self-conscious. Many people feel a bit embarrassed and nervous about visiting a specialist. Try to remember what, that whatever your worry is, you aren't the first person to ask, I assure you. Doctors are used to dealing with all sorts of problems. They can't help you if they don't know what's concerning you, so be completely open about what's on your mind. Parkinson's and the medications used to treat it can cause changes in behavior, mental health, mood, and in turn, in your relationships. That's really important. It's important that you feel comfortable bringing up these issues with, their doc with your doctor so they can adjust your medications if necessary. If you do feel too self-conscious about talking to your general practitioner or your specialist, give them a letter explaining your concerns. Let the letter do your talking for you if you're too embarrassed to put it into words during your appointment. In the, fa in the past, I've talked about the fact that Parkinson's affects everyone differently including the symptoms, what medications you take, your response to the medications, the dosage of the medications, <coughs> the timing of the medications, the side effects of the medications, just to name a few things that are unique to each individual. Along the same line is the fact that how your Parkinson's affects you can also vary greatly from day to day and even from hour to hour for some of you. As a result, you may find it difficult to remember exact details about some of your symptoms, including side effects and feelings that you may be having. In order to help you and your doctor understand how your condi condition affects you on a daily basis, it may be helpful to keep a diary. I mentioned the Parkinson's summary that is available for you here, just for the asking. You can email us, you can call us, but get in touch with us if you want a copy of that and possibly the other form that I mentioned as well earlier. But that Parkinson's summary that is available uh, for you also gives you the opportunity that, to tick some boxes for a big overall picture snapshot of what's going on on a general basis. For example, one of the statements reads, I have uncontrolled squirming movements, and then in brackets it says, dyskinesia. And another statement reads, I have trouble starting movements. I have trouble getting up out of a chair, for example. These statements, as I said, give you an overall picture of the doctor, uh, to the doctor. But doctors often want more information from you. For example, when does the dyskinesia start? Is it at the same time every day? How long does it last? On the back of that Parkinson's summary, there is a sample of a daily diary, which allows you to check the times of day when your symptoms coincide with these times, as well as when you take your medications. This is one of the times when I wish I could show you what the heck I'm talking about so that you can see what I'm referring to. Anyway, onwards and upwards. So the idea is to fill in this diary by checking one of the four choices for each hour of the day. And the choices are on with dyskinesia. So in other words, my medications are working really well, but I have uncontrolled movements. Another choice, on with no dyskinesia. In other words, medications are working, but you have no uncontrolled movements. Another choice is off. My medications are not working. And last but not least is 
asleep. That's, believe it or not, that is a box that needs to be checked too because that will give the doctor an idea of are you having sleep issues. So this chart that I'm talking about, this diary, also has a list of your current medications, the dosage, the time you're taking the medications. The idea is to help the neurologist adjust your medication timing because it really is all about the right medication, the right dose of the medication at the right time. Let me walk you through an example of a full day's diary so you can hopefully get what I'm trying to explain. Here goes. Close your eyes and try to picture this. The times of the day are written in a column down one side of the page. And beside each hour, there is a space to write down what is happening at that time, starting at 6 o'clock in the morning. So, for the sake of argument, we'll call the patient John. And this is how his day has unfolded. At 6 a.m., he has written in the box beside that, out of bed with help. 7 a.m., levodopa, that's his medication, his cinnamon. Selegiline, that's another medication. Rapinerol or Requip, another medication. So at 7 o'clock, he has taken three pills. And good for him, he's taken them one half hour before his breakfast, which is at 7.30 a.m. At 8 o'clock, Washed and dressed with help. Can't do buttons up on my own. Tremor in my hands makes putting on underwear very difficult. 9 a.m. Rested for an hour and read the paper. 10 a.m. Went to um, supermarket. Had to walk the full length of the car park as no space is available. Felt tired by the time we got to shop, so had to sit down for a rest in the cafe for 20 minutes before starting shopping. 11 a.m. Began to go off at about 11.30 while still shopping. So by 11.30 now, the doctor can see that the medication that he took at 7 is no longer working. So he's off now at 11.30. 12 o'clock. Lunch. I needed help to cut my food as my tremor very bad because I was so off. Took levodopa and requip. One o'clock. Started to come on at one o'clock. So by one o'clock after his 12 o'clock dose, he's now starting to come on and function more normally again. 2 p.m. He slept for one hour. 3 p.m walked in the garden, unaided, for half an hour. 4 p.m., freezing episode. 6 p.m., took levodopa and requip. 6.30, supper. 7 o'clock, I fell in the bedroom. Fortunately, my wife was able to pick me up off the floor, but I sustained cuts on my arm. 8 o'clock, mobility very poor. 10 o'clock, took my last dose of cinnamon for the day, was in bed at 10.30, had the same problems getting my clothes off as I had getting them on in the morning. Night, woke three times during the night with restless legs. So, after reading this example of a diary page of a patient's full day, the neurologist with examples like this of a typical day in your life can make adjustments to the timing of your medications to try and avoid as many off periods as possible, including freezing episodes. Keep in mind this was just one day in the life of this patient. So a doctor would need to see several days of diaries in order to establish a pattern of your ons and offs and to adjust your medications accordingly. I always refer to Parkinson's as a family affair, as medication adjustments are just as important for the care partner or the caregiver as they are for the patient. 
The doctor needs to know how Parkinson's is affecting your caregivers too. And keeping your own diary as caregivers will give both you as well as the doctor a good idea of what your days are really like. This could be a real eye-opener for, for all to see what the day in the life of a caregiver looks like. So here goes. This is the same day, same patient. Now, these are John's wife's words. She is his caregiver. Try to remember what John wrote. Here is what she wrote. 6 a.m. Woke up. Helped John get out of bed. 7 a.m. Reminded John to take his pills. Put the rest of the pills for the day in his pill box and set the timer. Made breakfast, <clears throat> ate breakfast, washed up. 8 a.m. John had a shower. Helped him in and out of the shower. He got dressed, can manage some of his clothes himself, but I have to do his buttons and help him with his underwear because of his tremor. I also help him with his shaving as well as the brushing of his hair. 9 a.m. John read the paper while I did the washing, the vacuuming, and made the beds. 10 a.m. John took, John took John for tests at the hospital. I drove, had to walk the full length of the car park as there were no spaces. 11 a.m. John went off while waiting for the blood test, so had to act, I had to act as his advocate for him during his test as he was unable to speak clearly. 11 a.m. Sorry, that's when he went off. Now we're at 12 o'clock noon. Reminded John to take his lunchtime pills. Prepared lunch. Helped him to cut his food as his tremor was very bad because he was so off. One o'clock. John's medication started to kick in. I took the clothes out of the machine, hung them on the line. Two o'clock. John slept. I did the finances and tidied the lounge. Three o'clock. We walked in the garden for half an hour. I had to accompany John because he's very apt to fall. Remember, John said he walked unaided? Well, not exactly true. Four o'clock, John had a freezing episode. I had to put my friend in front of him in order for him to get going again. Five o'clock, made a cup of tea and we watched TV. Six o'clock, reminded John to take his medications. Then I cooked supper and fed the dog. Seven o'clock, John fell in the lounge. I, he had sustained cuts and bruises. I helped him up and cleaned him up. Eight o'clock, John's mobility was so poor, I had to help him get off the toilet. Ten o'clock, reminded John to take his nighttime pills. Went to bed at 10.30, helped John get undressed just before that. Night of night time, woke up three times during the night as John had very restless legs and needing help, needed help turning over in bed. Sound familiar for those of you who are caregivers? Have you ever kept track of everything you do every day? Maybe it's time you started to do so. No wonder you're so tired. Keep a diary for yourself. There are just one or two more points I want to talk to you about today. The first thing is that it is very important to take someone with you to your appointment. Two heads and four ears are definitely better than one head and two ears. Let whoever comes with you know what you want to talk about before you get there so that, you can, so that that person can remind you if anything slips your mind. If you have problems speaking or writing, the person with you can speak on your behalf or take notes if necessary. I know you folks with Parkinson's don't like to hear what I'm, about, what I'm about to say, but the truth is that sometimes you don't see yourselves the way others do. 
I don't mean you intentionally don't tell the truth. You're just not always good assessors of yourself. And you naturally want to put your best foot forward and show the doctor how well you're doing. Don't forget, doctors can't treat what they can't see or what they're not told about. So it's very important to hear both your subjective analysis as well as your loved one's objective analysis of what's going on. Remember the differences I just read out to you between John's diary, the patient's diary, and the caregiver's diary? The extra detail in the caregiver's diary will help his doctor see how his ons, and in particular, his offs, impact his daily abilities. Last but certainly not least, I want to talk to you about your medications. I think it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that the main reason you are seeing your doctor and specialist is the, and the main reason why I have spent the last 45 minutes trying to help you to communicate effectively with your doctor is so that he or she can make changes if necessary to any and all aspects of your medication. So, my first suggestion is to take all your medications with you, including the bottles, packaging, etc., to ensure your doctor knows exactly what you are taking and when. If you are a really good, reliable record keeper, a list of what, how much, and when it's okay about your medication is okay, is okay too. But I think the actual bottles is the very best idea. Please, please, please don't try to remember what you're taking, particularly if you take a number of different medications. This is very, very risky. Some folks say, my doctor should know what I'm on. I shouldn't have to show him. Yes, in an ideal world, you're right. But doctors are human too. And you know as well as I do, their handwriting sucks. And, it, and is illegible at the best of times, even if even they can't read their own writing at times. So, not a good idea to rely on their notes. Make sure the doctor knows about any other drugs, vitamins, and supplements you're taking as well. If you are prescribed a new medication, make sure you understand what it's for and how you're supposed to take it. Don't just say, Thank you very much when the doctor hands you the prescription. You really need to be an informed consumer. What is on that prescription? What is the medication? And what is the medication for? If you are confused by some of the instructions, make sure you ask for an explanation. Also, make sure you understand what possible side effects you might experience and what to do if you do experience them. Have that diary with you that shows the time and dose of each medication and the length of time it takes for the medications to start working, as that will save you having to explain all this and waste valuable time during your appointment. This also lets the doctor see how well, or not so well, a recent change to your medications that he has made is working or not working. If you feel unsure after your appointment, don't worry. You can consult with your pharmacist, as pharmacists usually have more time to talk to you about your medications and how potential side effects may affect you. But it's really better to hear it from the doctor first. And finally, take your medication as prescribed and don't stop taking it without the knowledge and guidance of your doctor as to the safest way to do this, even if you feel the medication isn't working and you're finding it difficult to follow the regime that has been laid out for you. Complications don't necessarily mean that the drugs aren't effective. Your regimen may just need adjusting. Please remember, the brain is a very sensitive organ and does not react well to sudden changes, which is why medications are started so slowly to give it a chance to 
adjust to the change. The same principle applies in reverse when you're lowering the dose. And if you stop a medication cold turkey, you can do yourself a great deal of harm and give yourself complications that, in some cases, cause permanent irreversible damage. So, on that pleasant note, I'm going to stop this presentation. But don't hang up just yet. I want to go over a few of the most important tips from today's Sermon from the Mouth. Ways to improve your communication with your doctor. Remember, you are the con consumer. As a patient, it is important to remember that you are a consumer of health care. The best way to begin making difficult decisions about your health is to educate yourself about your Parkinson's. Start a health care journal. Having a health care journal or a notebook will allow you to keep all of your health information in one place. Keep a diary of your daily experiences with Parkinson's and your treatment. Prepare a list of questions. Write down your questions and concerns about your illness and your treatment before your next appointment. Write down the most important questions or concerns first. This way, you won't forget to ask about something that was important to you. Remember to try and make your questions very specific and brief, as your doctor has limited time. Once, you're appoint once at your appointment, ask the most important questions first. Bring someone with you to your appointments. Even if you have a journal or a diary and a prepared list of questions or concerns, it's always helpful to have support when you go to your appointments. If a person who accompanies you can serve again as a second set of ears, he or she may be able to think of questions to ask your doctor or remember details about your symptoms that you may have forgotten. Write down your doctor's answers. Take notes or take along that um, tape recorder, as I suggested, if that's the most important way. Don't leave the office, however, without some form of notes about what has transpired during your visit. Make sure that your doctor, of course, is, would allow you to record your visit. Do ask permission. Don't just assume that that's going to be okay to do that. Use I statements. By that I mean doctors may use medical language that is normal for them, but may be unfamiliar to you. If you're having trouble understanding your doctor, say, I'm sorry, I don't understand. That will be much more effective than saying, listen here, mister, you're being unclear. Explain to me what you're talking about. Be pleasant. Also, don't hesitate to be assertive. Again, if you don't know or understand something, don't be afraid to speak up. Also, be sure to ask your doctor how you can reach him or her, whether by phone or by email, outside of office hours, in case you have additional questions. So those are some of the tips that I wanted to share with you today. Last but not least, we do have another form it's very similar to the forms I've mentioned to you today. It's called Preparing for a Medical Appointment. And on it, there are four key points when you're talking to your doctor about any of your new concerns. They are location. Where on your body do you have the problem? Description. What is it like? Has it changed? How long has it been going on? Is it consistent or does it come and go? How bad is it, really, on a scale of 1 to 10? There's also a diagram so that you can look over all the possible symptoms that you could have. And this also will help the doctor to have a good visual of what's going on and will raise things that may not have come up during your appointment, such as changes in sleep patterns, lightheadedness, memory problems, 
dry or oily, oily scape, scalp or face, dry eyes, changes in vision, skin rash or redness, your tremors, slowness and stiffness, those are no-brainers. Those will be addressed. But will your nausea be addressed, constipation, your weight loss, possible impotence or lack loss of orgasm, decreased or increased sexual drive. What about the fact that maybe you're having trouble controlling your urine or your bowels? What about pain? So there are all kinds of things that you can go to your doctor with to prepare you for that appointment. Now, I did have one question sent to me today. It is about a medication called Domperidone. I know I've mentioned this medication to you in the past, so I just want to quickly, quickly, for those of you who may not have heard me mention it before, I said dom per idon, not dom per ignon. I'm not talking about the very expensive champagne here, okay? I really like my job and I don't want to get fired because my boss who is sitting beside me and giggling her head off now thinks I'm about to say that you should be asking the doctor to prescribe you some very expensive kind of champagne. I'm not doing that. Get it right. D-O-M-P-E-R-I-D-O-N-E. Domperidon. Okay. So, the bottom line with Domperidon. <clears throat> As many of you may have already experienced, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is leaving me again, your levodopa, your cinnamate, your prolopa, can have many side effects. Unfortunately, if there's a lot of dopamine circulating in your bloodstream in, in large amounts, it can stimulate the brain's vomiting center. Domperidone's job is to block the dopamine receptors in the body in order to prevent the nausea. That's Domperidone's job, basically. It gets very long and involved and complicated, and if the person who ask this question, want more answers about that, then you can always call me. But the bottom line is, Domperidone's job is to either stop or at least prevent 99% of the nausea from your medication if your medication is making you nauseated. It is usually only prescribed for people if they are having problems with nausea and that only happens right at the beginning of your journey with Parkinson's when the medication is first prescribed and your system is getting used to it. So again, um, it's not usually something that's necessary later on as your body will develop a tolerance to the medication, to your levodopa, and you won't need it forever. But it is a very good buffer at the beginning of your journey. So the one of the questions that this person has asked is, do neurologists use it a lot? I would say they use it quite often. I didn't tell you that the other name for domperidone is motilium. That's the um, brand name of domperidone is motilium. So some of you may be more familiar with the drug by that name. And neurologists use it as necessary. I can't say whether they you prescribe it a lot. Obviously, it depends on if their patients complain or how often their patients complain of nausea. But it is a wonderful line of defense against nausea. And we're blessed here in Canada that it is available here. It is not available in the United States, for example. And it's not available in many countries in Europe. So. Unfortunately, those folks have to suffer with the nausea, but it is available here. So if you're newly diagnosed and you're taking uh, levodopa for the first time and it is making you nauseated, don't hesitate to ask. Remember, don't order champagne, order Domperidone. Um, another question that this individual had is, can it be discontinued um, after use? The answer is yes, but again, another caveat, please be sure to make sure that you ask your doctor who has prescribed it how to stop taking it. 
can you stop taking it cold turkey or does it have to be titrated down also? Be sure to ask for guidance about that. It does not interact with other medications. As far as I know, it plays nicely with everything. It is to be taken at least 30 to 45 minutes before levodopa. So regardless of whether you're taking Cinemet or Prolopa, those are the two medications that most often cause the nausea, which is why I'm mentioning those specifically. Take it ahead of time. Don't take it at the same time. That's like trying to close the barn door after the horse is already out. So make sure that you give your tummy a buffer before you take your levodopa. Um, there are no side effects with domperidone. Um, generally speaking, it's, it's a great drug, so there are no uh, really bad adverse reactions with it. Um, I think that answers this person's question. The other question they had is, do people with Parkinson's tend to develop poor stomach muscle functioning, lead to feelings of being bloated? And I have mentioned this in previous talks as well. Bloating is quite common. We've talked a lot about the what we call the slowed gastric emptying. And as a result, um, people do feel bloated because their stomachs are not emptying as much in a timely fashion. Also, bloating can be a symptom of uh, problems with constipation. And again, if the person who um, ask this question, wants more information about stomach bloating, uh, they can give me a call. Okay, guys, so um, my watch says three minutes to one. My voice says, Sandy, shut up, so I'm going to stop talking now. Um, in April, which, by the way, in case you don't know, is Parkinson's Awareness Month, and if you don't know, you should, so get with the program. Um, it's, uh, my topic is going to be the stages of Parkinson's, what they are, and why it really doesn't matter. Oh, talk about an oxymoron. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to talk to you about what the stages are. It's a question that we frequently get. What stage is my Parkinson's at? Because with a lot of other conditions, the staging does matter, whether you have if you had cancer, for example, God forbid, if you had stage one versus stage four, it's, it's a big deal. Um, with Parkinson's, it doesn't really matter. The bottom line is, however, you deserve to know what the stages are. Those stages are there for a reason, so I will give you all the information that you don't need to know about that in April. So, guys, enjoy this lovely weather. I hope wherever you are in this country, that your weather is nice. Happy spring, and I'll look forward to being able to chat with you in April. Take care. Love you all. Big hugs, and bye for now. The leader has turned lecture off, and your line has been unmuted. unmuted.